Yeah, so I guess I forgot about this, huh? Well, it's as good a time as ever to finish up the rest of the Prehistoric Planet episodes, so without further ado, let's get going. Prehistoric Planet is now officially fully out on Apple TV Plus for everyone to enjoy. This whole project was, according to Dr. Steve Bursati, about 10 years in the making. Precisely what that means in regard to exact start times, fundraising, and expert collecting all the way to the finished product is unknown. Surprisingly scant are references to the directors of the show, Andrew Jones and Adam Valdez. Aside from the artist doing all the hard hands-on work with the dinos and the paleontologists guiding their hands, the directors are the most important in regard to how the show is shot, how the animals are portrayed, and much more. The show is also produced by BBC Studios Natural History Unit in conjunction with Jon Favreau of Iron Man, Chef, Lion King, The Mandalorian, and Jungle Book fame as executive producer and showrunner. The visual effects were done by The Moving Picture Company with narration by David Attenborough. The soundtrack was composed by Hans Zimmer, Kara Talv, and Anz Rosman. Talv and Rosman even invented and modded new instruments for the show in order to make some truly amazing sounds to mirror the truly amazing science going into this series. And I also want to show you the fat Rex that we use for our Velociraptor theme. I don't think it is exaggerating to call Prehistoric Planet not just a successor to Walking with Dinosaurs, but a superior production aided by Hollywood money and cooperation among everyone involved. No one's expertise was thrown out by executive meddling or a director's personal preference. <coughs> It would be a crime not to shout out the animators and CGI artists that worked on this project. Something Apple and BBC apparently couldn't spare the time to do with their credits. Shashank Shakar is a texture and visual effects artist that worked on the project for one and a half years, specifically working on the Velociraptors, Coethoraptor, Therizinosaurus, Beelzebufo, Ornithomimus, and Troodonts. Another artist that went uncredited is Cameron Clough, who is a creature animator and pre-viz, post-viz artist for Marvel, HBO, and BBC. On top of that, he is a part-time animator for Prehistoric Kingdom, hence the quite lifelike movements. He worked on the Triceratops segment, as he has more expertise in the muscles, movement, and life appearance of these guys. Taurosaurus is his favorite dinosaur after all. Sanjay Singh worked on some of the main animals, like the Tarbosaurus, Cicernosaurus, and more, with the Moving Picture Company. Alan Bolkas was also with the Moving Picture Company, with Damien Guymoneau and Anthony Sieben, and supervised by Dan Zelks. Michaela Dahl, who goes by Silvery Lantern on Twitter, and Sean Lack, or Momentarily Epic on Twitter, were also animators brought on board the team. I'm confident that I'm missing some people here, as this project was a monumental effort by a monumental team. Unfortunately, there is only so much I can do to find everyone involved when the show kinda made very little effort to highlight those same people, so I apologize to those I have left out. Unfortunately, the caveat for the whole series is that it only takes place 66 million years ago. However, it takes us all over the world to show us animals that the general audience has never seen before. 
It also has to show you animals you know, but thanks to 20 plus years of new information since Walking with Dinosaurs, these old favorites are refurbished to show the audience how much the hard science of paleontology has changed. It also doesn't take place precisely at 66 million years. It is stated to be 66 million years for simplification, but it takes place between 72 and 66 million years, just for clarification. These are the most accurate prehistoric animals ever to be recreated in video form. Each episode covers a biome across the planet rather than a chunk of time. It was a five-night event with five episodes each coming out on each of those five nights. Recap The Deserts episode of Prehistoric Planet begins as Coasts, and every episode from here on out starts. I described it in my review of Coasts, so I won't do it here. It's just Attenborough talking to us and being profound or something. The True Deserts episode opens up with an upward panning shot of a vast open salt plain, before we are presented with a herd of somethings out in the distance. Attenborough announces that we are in South America, which was then a very desolate place, or at least we are in a desolate region of South America. As David continues, he sets the scene for the awesome behaviors we are about to witness. This area is the stage to which the herd of dinosaurs on the horizon migrate to to gather and do some funky mating dances. These are Dreadnoughtus, a very large sauropod from Argentina. This segment of the episode shows us what is called lecking behavior. The herds congregate on the salt flats and the males fight each other for access to the whole herd of females. We get to see a large, older, dominant male fight a younger male and lose. He takes a tumble and just dies inexplicably. Some online have said that it is inferred that he dies due to stress, but I never got that from the narration. From there, we are taken to another desert in another region of the planet, Mongolia. We are treated to some footage of a real lizard that stands in for a prehistoric one. It is then hunted by a velociraptor. Both of these critters stumble upon a pack of sleeping Tarbosaurus. The Velociraptor tries to catch the lizard without waking up the large predators, snapping up some lizards as it does so before getting nipped at by the Tyrannosaurs. As the Tyrannosaurs wake up and leave, we get to see that they had been chowing down on a sauropod carcass. As they leave, a small flock of unnamed Ashtarkid pterosaurs come down for a snack. I will say that the juxtaposition of a giant sauropod carcass in this scene, right after a scene of a sauropod dying and decaying, made it seem like the carcass was meant to be that of the Dreadnoughtus that died. But the Tarbosaur scene obviously takes place in Mongolia, not South America, so that was just a tad narratively confusing in my opinion. The next segment is the Mononychus one. The female Mononychus digs into an old log to get some real live grubs, showing the viewer one of the main possible uses these bizarre dinosaurs had for their giant single claws. I am almost certain that the claw that digs into the wood log is an actual physical effect because of the way it interacts with the log. From there, we get to the wet season and the Mononychus hides. After the rain comes, the flowers come out and we get to see the little theropod dance around the flowers hunting beetles. The next segment takes us away to one of the most common tropes of any nature documentary. It's common for a reason, it happens all the time in real life, watering hole gatherings. So this scene takes place in Mongolia as well, and we get to see whole herds of various dinosaurs, like Barsboldia, an as yet unnamed giant Mongolian sauropod, there is an Asaurus, some background Tarchia, and we get to see the Tarbosaurus again. Since all animals need water, especially in deserts or during times of drought, all of these critters have to reduce their fight or flight responses in order to get some water. We get to see a very Lion King or Jungle Book-esque scene of the Tarbosaurus coming down to drink, and the herds of Hadrosaurs parting so as not to get their faces sliced in half. This may seem a bit too Disney-fied, but this sort of thing literally just happens today, all over the place, but most exemplary around African waterholes. From there, we are treated to another scene involving the Barbary Dactylus that we saw in the Coasts episode. This time, it is speculated that they migrate a bit to these plateaus to breed. Males have the long antlers and females have little nub crests. 
This segment serves to explain to the viewer the concept of sneaky mating behaviors. We see this today in many animal groups like red deer, elephant seals, lizards, and more. Some males are born with underdeveloped mating displays and drab female-like colors. Their role is to mate with the females that are hoarded by the other males. Because the sneaky male looks female and perhaps acts female, he will pass under the supervision of the male and mate with some females, and thus the femboy barbaridactylus meme was born. All of this is speculative for these pterosaurs, but since we see it across the animal kingdom today, there is no reason to assume this did not occur in other various extinct groups in the past. Finally, we get to visit another herd of dinosaurs, Cicernosaurus of Argentina. These guys migrate across the desert looking for water with the babies taking it hardest. This segment serves to teach the viewer about animal migrations. We finally get to see a scene of dinosaurs admiring the night sky though, so that was neat. At the end, the herd reaches the coast and is greeted by some mist. And that was Deserts. Tell me what your favorite segment is from this episode in the comment section below. Onward to the meat and potatoes, the reason you're here. Animal Accuracies or Not the point of this whole endeavor was to show what the public knows as the main characters of the late Cretaceous, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and the marine reptiles in as natural and accurate a light as modern science and technology could make possible. To marry the groundbreaking technology produced for and used in the film industry to bring back the long dead with the help of cutting edge dinosaur science. As such, every single critter should be as up to date as studies and fossils will allow, and any sort of soft tissue structure or behavior should be backed up with as much parsimony as possible. Has Prehistoric Planet succeeded in this venture? Well, in order to answer this question, we must first painstakingly approach each and every design with information from the literature, the fossil record, and from the very words of the scientists who were consulted for the project. Kirsten Formoso, Professor Steve Brusati, John Hutchinson, Robert Spicer, and Paul Valdez, Drs. Darren Nash, Mark Witten, Victoria Arbor, Alexander Farnsworth, and Scott Hartman. Dreadnoughtus Design In this episode, the animal is represented as a lecking and or harem species. A herd of Dreadnoughtus migrate to a salt flat. The females congregate in groups to watch males display to one another and to them. The dreadnoughtus here are decked out in lots of muscle and fat. They are healthy animals. The weirdest and coolest thing here is the mating display, which consists of inflatable sacks along the neck, as well as a brutish wrestling match. Bronto Smash a lot of the soft tissues in this show are influenced by the fossil record as well as inferences from modern animals. But there is of course some speculation thrown in as well. A lot more speculation is used when it comes to reconstructing behaviors, but none of these behaviors are purely made up. All of them are seen in many different groups of modern animals. These behaviors are seen across many different groups that vary in metabolisms, intelligence, and evolution. So showing them here in some extinct forms of animals is not implausible, nor impossible. The lecking thing is unknown in just about any extinct animal. It is behavior. How could it fossilize? The makers wanted to show how lecking might work in sauropods, and since the sauropod dinosaurs lasted from the late Triassic to the very end of the Cretaceous period, I don't see why it would be implausible that at least one species developed such a behavior. Their inflatable neck balls are another itty bit of speculation. The sauropod dinosaurs had a labyrinthine system of air sacs throughout their bodies. They were attached to the lungs and invaded the spinal column all the way to the tip of the tail and base of the skull. Here, the researchers on board the series have implied that perhaps these air sacs connected to gular sacs of the throat in a similar fashion to the living greater sage grouse, and voila, inflatable air sacs. Some nitpickers have pointed out that it would be weird for the sacs to inflate first from the head down to the base of the neck, as gular display structures in living species inflate upon exhalation. So they should inflate from the lungs up, not the head down. Eh! 
Some have also remarked upon the facial expressions of the beasts as they tussle, but I don't really see it as anything other than their mouths slightly opening and closing as they breathe. Dreadnoughtus is reconstructed with a thumb claw on the hand. The thing is that the hand bones are largely fragmentary in both Dreadnoughtus specimens. They lack the parts of the hand where the thumb would be. In general, most titanosaurs lost their thumb claw and thumb. However, Diamantinosaurus, a titanosaur from Australia, was found with a thumb and thumb claw. A few other thumb claws are known or suspected from fragmentary or otherwise controversial late Jurassic and early Cretaceous forms. So the presence of it here in prehistoric planets Dreadnoughtus is entirely possible, but more on the speculative side. Could they rear? Yep. Only a little bit of research has been done on how likely it was for massive sauropods to rear up on their hind limbs. It was proposed all the way back in the early 1900s by racist eugenicist Henry Fairfield Osborne, stay mad chuds, where the sauropod would use its tail as a prop or third leg. The conjecture was even used as a basis for the Barasaurus skeletal mount at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. A 2005 paper hypothesized that you would find stress fractures in the forelimbs if sauropods were rearing up on their hind limbs, but none were found. A 2009 study by Heinrich Malison found that diplodocid sauropods, uropatosaurs, dicreosaurs, and diplodocids were the most adapted to rearing of all the sauropods, and even better adapted for it than elephants. They have their center of gravity right over their hips, had the most mobile necks, a well-muscled pelvis, and tail, and tail vertebrae shaped to bear the brunt of heavy loads. The same study found that titanosaurs were not so well adapted, and brachiosaurs were likely entirely incapable due to a wonky center of gravity. That seems to rule out Dreadnoughtus as a rearer, but we're not done. Dr. Darren Nash has pointed out that it should be possible, due to their wide hips, agility, strong leg muscles, and muscular tails. Considering the fighting males only rear for a very short time, I find it to be pretty plausible and possible. Plenty of animals alive today do things they aren't specifically adapted for, and sometimes stuff that even causes pain, and yet they still do it, live from it, and continue to do it without evolutionary consequences. I personally find it odd that the one that fell over and lost seemed to have just died. If they can rear, bite, and batter each other, I don't see why lightly flopping over in defeat would be enough to crush the ribcage and die. Tarbosaurus Design After the Dreadnoughtus battle, we get to see a pack of Tarbosaurus lounging around like big birdie lizard puppers. Tarbosaurus is an awfully close relative to Tyrannosaurus and has been lumped into the Tyrannosaurus genus a few times by different researchers over the years. The genus was named in the 1950s based on a bunch of great fossils from late Cretaceous Mongolia. It was like a lighter, smaller form of Tyrannosaurus, hence why it has been named Tyrannosaurus a couple times. There seems to be just a few too many differences between the two to lump them though. Like the Tyrannosaurus of the first episode, these Tarbosauruses are filled out with muscle and fat to the point at which they look like healthy real-world animals. Interestingly, they are replete with a reddish top and tan bottom, with more black outlined tan spots across their top, similar to many modern lizards and forest-dwelling big cats. They do seem more like the spots seen on a lot of desert lizards though. Their faces are covered in lip-like oral tissues, which a recently published study has reinforced as the default facial covering for all terrestrial vertebrate animals. The prehistoric planet team has also reconstructed their Tarbosauruses with a fine covering of short filaments that you can only barely see. Dr. Darren Nash stated that despite the possibility of Tyrannosaurids having filaments being a controversial topic, some recent studies conclude that filaments may indeed have been present along the dorsal midline at least. Nash stated that, All I'll say at this point is that the scientific discussion isn't over, and that the presence of both scales and filaments should be considered very much possible. Behavior the first segment with the Tarbosaurus has them lounging and napping after a big meal. This is very similar to many modern mammals, but I mean, I'm pretty sure every animal does this. 
Reptiles bask after eating and lounge around. It's just nice to see dinosaurs acting like the animals they were and doing absolutely nothing. I have similarly little to say about the Tarbosaurus when it reappears later in the episode during the waterhole scene. It shows up, comes up to the water, and leaves. The rest of the animals give it a lot of space because of the obvious, and we see this among herbivores and carnivores in modern watering holes. Velociraptor Design This is easily and obviously the most accurate Velociraptor ever put to screen. There is a strong possibility that the dromaeosaur designs in prehistoric planets are extremely close to how the real animal actually looked, barring fat distribution and colors and patterns. The velociraptors are well endowed with lots of fat and muscles as well as the connective tissues around the arms and legs, like the propatagium. These velociraptors are clad in a coat of simple filamentous feathers and complete veined feathers. This is both an inference from its closest relatives that have been preserved with feather impressions in their skeletons, as well as direct evidence of feathers in a specimen of Velociraptor itself. A forelimb bone of Velociraptor has been described with a series of little knobs sticking out the back. These knobs correspond to the exact size and placement of what are called quill knobs in living dinosaurs. Plenty of birds do not have quill knobs, but if those knobs are present, they mean that there definitely were feathers there. If velociraptors had these quill knobs, they would have had large complex feathers on their arms. And if they had these kinds of wings, it is also quite likely that they had feathers covering the rest of their bodies from head to toe. This is backed up by the organization of feathers in other dromaeosaur fossils that have them preserved. Each of them was covered from head to toe in feathers, just like birds. If we take a look at the faces of these velociraptors, we will see something quite unique. The prehistoric planet team gave the velociraptors leathery skin around the jaw edges with some keratinization here and there. They look quite keratinized to me, or at least keratinized skin, but Dr. Nash states they are meant to be leathery skin, so I will go with that. As per the most recent work on theropod lips and considering the presence of formina and surface textures of Velociraptor, it should have lips just as any other non-avian theropod. Some researchers and artists have hypothesized that dromaeosaurs have had keratinized skin or pure keratin sheaths over their face almost like bird beaks, but not much evidence exists for this. Hardened skin that became like keratin or straight up keratinized over time may be possible, what with the presence of formina and the rough or etched textures of the lip edge in Velociraptor. But I think more might need to be done before something as clear as keratin sheaths can be quantified for these dinosaurs. Another interesting thing to note about the anatomy of these raptors is their sickle claws. They are absurdly long and curly, and this is exactly what they would have looked like. This assertion is based on how much the keratin sheath over the claw bone extends the length of the claw in modern birds, but also other reptiles. This is also backed up by dromaeosaur specimens that directly preserve some chemical components or imprints of the keratin sheaths showing that the condition of the keratin sheath in dromaeosaurs closely mirrored that seen in modern birds of prey. Now, there is another odd bit about the velociraptors in this episode. Technically, the genus Velociraptor did not live with Tarbosaurus. Tarbosaurus fossils come from the Nemect formation, approximately 70 million years ago. Velociraptor comes from the Dejokta Formation and Bayan Mandahu Formation, both being about 75 to 71 million years ago. The thing is, though, that fossils of Velociraptorine dromaeosaurs have been found in the rock layers that also preserved Tarbosaurus fossils. They are just too fragmentary to name. The traits that are preserved in these specimens are so close to Velociraptor proper that further studies may even find them to be additional species of Velociraptor itself. So, for the sake of simplicity and popularity, the people behind Prehistoric Planet decided to use the name Velociraptor within the episode proper. Behavior 
the Velociraptors are shown individually hunting down lizards in the shadows of the snoozing Tarbosaurs. They are not portrayed as pack hunters, but as more opportunistic, perhaps partially social animals. They are seen moving in twos or threes on occasion. Support for this inclusion, as Dr. Nash has noted, comes from dromaeosaur trackways and the behavior of modern predatory birds. The only cooperative modern bird of prey is the Harris's hawk. They are known to hunt in groups of two to six. This makes pack hunting quite rare among birds, and perhaps it was rare in theropod dinosaurs as well. Pterosaurs In comes the pterosaur segment. Having had some of the world's most renowned pterosaur experts on the consultant team, like Drs. Mark Witten and Darren Nash, the pterosaur anatomy is perfectly reconstructed here to what is known of them. Many have questioned why the pterosaurs in this series fold their wings up so tightly that the ends look like spiny fingers. This question arises from a paleoart meme in which the end of the pterosaur wing is reconstructed as lobe-like or spoon-shaped. This was touted, even by me, as the accurate way to reconstruct the wingtip after the new dino renaissance of the 2010s as a result of the All Yesterday's Book and Movement. This meme is just that, a meme, and not really based on any data collected from the bones. The fact is that pterosaurs could adjust their wings better than bats can today. The arm bones were invaded by huge air sacs which, in conjunction with the huge muscles, would have made the wings themselves rather thick. On top of that, the wings were made up of different layers of tissues. One of those layers contained a special type of fiber, actinofibrils, that cross-hatched the other wing tissues and themselves. They allowed the animal to relax or tense the wing as desired. The wing itself was kept in an outswept angle when flying, almost a Superman pose. All of this is shown in the prehistoric planet pterosaurs and makes them the best they have ever looked. Perhaps even more than the dinosaurs since pterosaurs rarely get proper attention. An interesting aspect of pterosaur biology, which was briefly noted by David, and which has been known for a while but firmed up recently, is what the hell kind of eggs these things were laying. Turns out these critters laid soft-shelled eggs, like crocodiles and turtles. We never see the Alcyone eggs in this episode, but they are referred to as soft-shelled. We do see pterosaur eggs in the freshwater episode, but I'll save that discussion for that episode. Unnamed Mongolian Ashtarchids Design There are currently no known named Ashtarchid pterosaurs from the Nemect Formation of Mongolia. Ashtarchids being the group of pterosaurs consisting of the largest pterosaurs and things to ever fly, like Quetzalcoatlus and Hatchagopteryx, which serendipitously also show up in this show. The Ashtarchids in the segment with the Tarbosaurus may be based on some fragmentary neck bones described in 2017. They were absolutely enormous and probably belonged to an animal similar in size to those other giant pterosaurs I listed earlier. Nothing I say about the overall design of these guys here will be new once I reach Quetzalcoatlus as these guys use the exact same model with a few minor adjustments. All I will say here is that they are extremely up to date with what is known of these animals. Dr. Nash pointed out that these pterosaurs utilize the forward-swept wing configuration that they likely used at times. They are covered in soft feathers, have nice soft tissues filling out their bodies and heads, and have the uniquely tightly folded wings that we saw in the pterosaurs in the Coast episode and will continue to see throughout the series. This is not unusual in a scientific sense, I just never really see it like that very often. Behavior not much can be said of their behavior. Their presence in this segment is to teach the viewer that scavengers have existed since the dawn of time. These pterosaurs, unlike large predatory theropods, <coughs> Jack Horner, <coughs> are uniquely well adapted for being scavengers, not unlike vultures, though I doubt these guys were doing that all the time. Mononychus Design all dinosaurs are bizarre to us, that is their nature. That being said, there are some groups that resemble some critters we still see today. Crocs, ostriches, and crows. Some share some similar body parts with modern animals, like the sauropods or armored dinosaurs. 
However, there are some super specialized groups of extinct dinosaurs that just go the extra mile in weirdness. One of those groups is the Alvarisauria. These guys were small to medium sized theropod dinosaurs that sort of resembled the ostrich dinosaurs. They ran about on long, gawky legs, had unremarkable tails and torsos, medium length but skinny necks, small, pointed, and beaked skulls, but the weirdest part is their arms. The majority of the members of this group carried around a pair of some of the shortest arms among the dinosaurs, far shorter comparatively than the tyrannosaurs. The bones of these arms were squashed and enlarged. They were heavily reinforced and sprouted all sorts of flanges for muscle support. The fingers were mostly reduced or entirely gone except for one absolutely giant finger that was capped by a huge recurved claw. The largest and most well-known member of this group is the Mononychus. The prehistoric planet Mononychus is reconstructed using the style guide of a barn owl. I personally don't like using the color schemes of living animals on extinct ones because it is mathematically difficult to explain how the exact same colors and patterns came about in two different animals that are doing completely different things. However, I think the prehistoric planet team did a really good job of changing up the barn owl coloration and pattern enough to make it something more unique. This Mononychus is covered in simple filamentous feathers across its body and more complex ones on its arms and tail. Evidence from CT scans of the internal ear anatomy of the Alvarosaur Shuvuya shows that Mononychus and Kin were owl-like in hearing abilities and likely had facial discs, hence the owl-like coloration, but also the owl-like soft tissues on the face and its general twitchy mannerisms. Behavior the overall reduced size and proportions of the arms, but enlargement and reinforcement of singular bones and reduction of the hands to just a big pick-like claw are a set of traits seen only in animals that hunt for social insects by using their forelimbs to tear open hard substrates. The anteaters, pangolins, and some armadillos, and maybe even the Triassic drepranosaurs. So, this is also the best guess for how alvarosaurs fed. The Mononychus digs up termites from dead wood, not a termite mound. Traces of wood nesting termites are common in some Cretaceous deposits, whereas it is disputed whether mound building termites were present in the Mesozoic at all. Termite eaters also often have a long tongue. A tongue skeleton, the hyoids, is preserved in one alvarosaur specimen and reported to be well developed. A toothless tip of the lower jaw may have allowed a long tongue to protrude. Alvarosaurs had awfully long legs for their size, which probably helped them not only escape predators, but also travel efficiently for long distances. And as mentioned in the episode, alvarosaurs may have traveled a lot, for insect colonies can be very widely dispersed. The newest alvarosaur discovery shown in prehistoric planet is their great hearing. A study a few years ago found that they had similar inner ear structures to barn owls, which hunt primarily by ear. Some modern termite eaters like the bat-eared fox listen for prey too. Waterhole Something I would like to say about the entire watering hole scene unattached to the individual species involved is something that Dr. Nash spoke about. They came up with specific drinking behaviors for each of the animals. Sauropods are suction drinkers. They submerge the whole mouth and nose to drink. Yes, there are animals that do this. Ornithischians use a vertical tongue motion called piston drinking. And the theropods are scoop drinkers. Barsbolia. Design. Barsbolia is the first animal we meet during the waterhole segment. This hadrosaur was first discovered in 1970 and assumed to belong to the then already known Sauralophus. In 1981, the remains of the animal would get a proper name and publication as Barsbolia. Unfortunately, the single specimen of the animal is its back end. That means, for its appearance in Prehistoric Planet, the team decided to rework their Edmontosaurus model. 
An unusual feature of Barsboldia is its extra-tall neural spines that ran along its hips and tail, and probably continued along its back toward its head. With the traits preserved in the back half of the skeleton, Barsboldia has been found to be a sorolophene hadrosaur, making it relatives to the flat-headed and tall-nosed hadrosaurs of the later Cretaceous. Specifically, it has been found as most closely related to Shantungosaurus and Edmontosaurus. Therefore, reusing the model of the prehistoric planet Edmontosaurus and adding some taller spines is perfectly fine here. It likely had something similar going on with its noggin that others of its group had going on. I quite like the colors and patterns used on these guys. They are also the most numerous at the watering hole. Behavior not much can be said of their behavior as they are not involved in the episode for very long. Once the Tarbosaurus comes to take a drink, the Barsboldia part to let him in. The Hadrosaurs are not too worried here because, as Dr. Nash points out, herbivores must be hyper aware of the body language of predators and the predators must not give off hunting signals if they want to drink. Therizinosaurus this is the best look at Therizinosaurus we get in the entire show. It is in broad daylight. However, it is also the briefest of looks and therefore there is not much to say. Therizinosaurus reappears in another episode, so I will go more in depth on its design there. As for this episode, the Therizinosaurus is covered in a ton of feathers, as is known for its entire family, and they were not entirely too large to need to reduce the amount of feathering going on. I like the reddish colors. Tarchia. For as little as there was to say about Therizinosaurus, there was far less for Tarchia. It's not entirely known whether the ankylosaur that pops up in the background, all blurred out, even is Tarchia, but considering Tarchia will appear in Prehistoric Planet Season 2, and considering the probable reuse of location and animals, this is probably a Tarchia. I think I will reserve discussion on the design for when Season 2 comes out, even though we have a teaser image of the animals. They do look amazing. Mongol Titan Design One of the unnamed sauropods at the watering hole gets a little bit of spotlight as the Mongolian Titan. The Mongolian Titan is represented by a gigantic sauropod footprint from the Gobi Desert that's around 1 meter long. It's proof of gigantic titanosaurs in the area at the time, but there have yet to be any fossils of them found. Interestingly, there are super fragmentary fossils of giant sauropods known from Cretaceous Mongolia, with some even getting their own names, though these are unlikely to be the absolutely massive ones that made the huge footprints. Mongolosaurus, for example, is known from teeth, bits of skull, and some neck vertebrae. However, it is also from the Ongong Formation, which is unfortunately early Cretaceous in age. Behavior The giant sauropods don't really do enough stuff in this segment for behavior to be a big thing to talk about. They put their whole damn head in the water to suck it up, as stated earlier on in this video. So that's cool. Enantiornithine Design One often overlooked part of Cretaceous ecosystems is the birds. Birds before the cave pig extinction were definitely not the dominant masters of the skies, but they were quite diverse and pretty much worldwide in distribution. The most common group of birds around during the Cretaceous was the Enantiornithines, a bunch of short-tailed birds with teeth behind their beaks and clawed fingies on their hands beneath their wings. They went extinct at the K-Pig boundary, but some modern bird groups that sprouted right before the extinction sailed through. The ones present in the desert's episode are seen from far away and in comparison to the larger dinosaurs, so we don't get to see too much detail on them, but they seem pretty standard for enantiornithines. Since the Mongolian segments all seem to be trying to replicate the Nemect formation, there is only one named enantiornithine it could be. Gurilinia. Barbary Dactylus. Design. Our last pterosaur continues the trend of this Moroccan dig site with very little substantive skeletal remains. Barbary Dactylus is another nyctosaurid pterosaur, but much larger than any of the remains known of Alcyone. 
the most complete specimen. Also, the holotype is a femur, a radius, ulna, humerus, the shoulder blade, and a chunk of the lower jaw. All other specimens are humeri. Kinda sucks, man. For those that may complain about showing off this ecosystem of partial pterosaurs, I must note the creators are trying to show the unique nature of the ecosystem as well as the diversity in pterosaur body forms more than they are trying to recreate these specific genera of pterosaurs perfectly. It also just so happens that these reconstructions are spot on in comparison to pterosaurs known from more complete remains. So criticism, though somewhat warranted, is largely moot in this particular case. Barbary Dactylus is shown here with the typical nyctosaurid body plan, complete with a tuning fork style antler crest jutting out the back of the skull, similar to Nyctosaurus itself. Since the full skull of Barbary Dactylus is unknown, they went with a different shape of the crest to Nyctosaurus but kept the overall antler idea to better provide a compare and contrast to the other pterosaurs in the segment. The uncovered segment for the Deserts episode, which has a sequence dedicated to Barbary Dactylus, shows a completely fabricated skull of Barbary Dactylus in the museum library set with David. Though this skull is based on other close relatives and probably isn't that far off from the real Barbary Dactylus skull, I do think it should have been pointed out that it is hypothetical. I think it would have been a good opportunity to compare it with the known skull of Nyctosaurus, to explain why they went with a Nyctosaurus style head crest and why they did not do a segment with Nyctosaurus itself. The reason being that Nyctosaurus lived 87 to 82 million years ago along the Western Interior Seaway, thus making it out of reach of the time frame for the series. You can't really tell their color scheme or the level of feathering due to the lighting of the scene. When they appear again in the Deserts episode, I'll touch on that. Behavior the idea that big showy pterosaur males work to maintain territories and attract females is well supported, and Prehistoric Planet shows male-to-male -male combat and male display as part of the main story. Lots of opportunity for posturing, vocalizing male display, but tens of species today that behave this way have also evolved sneaky males that anatomically mimic females and gain female access in other ways. This must have happened in the past, and the Prehistoric Planet team wanted to bring attention to this possibility. Cicernosaurus Design The last dinosaur and the last segment of deserts is the Cicernosaurus migration. Cicernosaurus is a late Cretaceous Patagonian hadrosaur that was originally found in 1923 but was not described or named until 1979. It has had an unusual history regarding what it is related to and who is related to it. It was the first hadrosaur from South America to get a scientific designation, but it was not the first to be found and plenty more were found in the time between when it was found and when it was named. In 2010, some researchers hypothesized that another South American hadrosaur, Critosaurus australis, was actually the same animal as Cicernosaurus. Five years after that, some more researchers argued that they should remain separate organisms. Then, in 2022, when Prehistoric Planet had already been made and was airing, another study came out that analyzed the Critosaurus australis specimens in detail and were able to find enough evidence that not only are Cicernosaurus and Critosaurus australis two distinct species, but that Critosaurus australis was its own genus as well. So, they renamed it Hualasaurus australis. Now, according to post by Dr. Nash, the critter in the show should really be Hoalosaurus, which means that they had been using Hoalosaurus in the show before it had been renamed and was considered just another specimen of Cicernosaurus. That being said, both are from Cretaceous rocks in Patagonia, different regions of Patagonia, but still the same overall part of the South American continent. Both are closely related and both may have looked rather similar, so calling Hawalosaurus Cicernosaurus here isn't like the worst scientifically accurate sin you could have made, nor could they have possibly known what research was being done on them behind the scenes. The Cicernosaurus show some really cool differences in age, with the juveniles having the usual shorter faces and bigger eyes, but also a neat reddish top and cream bottom with some subtle striping. 
the adults have less subtle striping and some splotches of an almost iridescent green and blue on the face, with the red replaced with dark stripes over a light background color. I love any close-up we get of these models because you can pick out each individual scale, showing the level of detail put into this. Behavior in the Cicernosaurus segment of the Deserts episode, the animals are shown using the stars to find their way out of the desert and to the coast to get some moisture. This is based on its prevalence in living animals that make huge treks. Hadrosaur ear anatomy, based on the many skulls across the Hadrosaur family that have been CT scanned, reveals a huge sensitivity to low frequency sounds, perhaps even infrasound. This seems to be relatively common among the big dinosaurs, so they may have communicated with one another through these types of sounds. The science used for this show is groundbreaking. The speculative nature of a lot of the stuff shown is equal parts necessary and representative of the real world. Two of the main consultants, Drs. Mark Witten and Darren Nash, helped to bring forth the modern dinosaur renaissance with their little paperback landmark book, All Yesterdays. I've made a two-part series of their work here on Edge that you can view to get a really good idea of the kinds of visions that team was trying to convey. With their work, they were not trying to say that speculation should be taken as gospel or that those who cautioned conservativeness in reconstructing long dead animals are wrong. Instead, their intention was to show the world that the animals of the past are as the animals of today, gross, complex, and alive. The world around us has only been around us for 1 to 2 million years. Before us, the modern paradigm has been around for 66 million years. Before that, there was an unfathomable expanse of time, 184 million years of time. If I wanted to really scramble your brain, there is an even more unfathomable expanse of time before that. But we're talking dinosaurs right now. For as alien as certain parts of the Mesozoic era may seem, the laws of nature retained their stranglehold. Animals of the Mesozoic had a much longer period of time to get gross and complex, so to think so narrowly as to only reconstruct the animals of the past as closely as their bones can say is to completely ignore everything we know about life. In fact, because of the much longer period of time that the dinosaurs had, it is nearly mathematically impossible to think they didn't get into weirder stuff than we see today. This seems to have been the driving force behind Prehistoric Planet, at least with the consultants and animators. I mean, we all know Favreau just wanted them to act like animals and look pretty. No shame or shade there. So what did you think of Prehistoric Planet? This video is way too hefty to only now get into the music, cinematography, and directing, or my criticisms therein. I have just gone through every single aspect regarding the science behind this show based on the very sparse information we have right now. Darren's tweets and the uncovered segments can only tell us so much. I think I can speak for everyone that we are eagerly awaiting a behind-the-scenes documentary on the documentary. In the meantime, we can only imagine. I do apologize for not getting to the rest of the series until the near premiere of Season 2. But it is what it is. At least it might get you to relook at Season 1 before we get more goodies. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.